Good morning. I don't know that I like to follow peanut butter eggs because I feel like you've all checked out now and you're all about the sugar. When can I get back to my eggs? I'll try to make it worth your while here. This morning I want to remind you that you had a lot of faith when you came in this morning. And it started with when you decided which chair you were going to sit in. And you had faith that it wasn't going to fall to the floor when you sat down in it. We can have faith in a lot of other things. Like uh, if we decide we're going to go to the UP and back, we have faith that the Mighty Mac is not going to fall into Lake Huron or Lake Michigan, depending on which side of the state you're from. We have faith that the sun is going to continue to rise every day for the rest of our lives. Sometimes we have misplaced faith that this snack item that costs less than $1 is adequate nutrition and will make me happy for the entire afternoon, just like the commercial told me. Faith. How should we define faith? I've got some suggestions here. Faith is believing in something that we can't see, which maybe doesn't refer so much to the chair that you can see and feel, and you know that support is there. Faith is knowing something is true, regardless of what our experience or situation suggests. Um, how many people, when they cross the bridge, still drive on the paved lane and not on the graded one where you can see the water, just in case? And faith is trusting that the thing that we believe in will continue to be true indefinitely. So for our purposes today, faith is all of those things that you can read applied to God. God is creator of everything, sustainer of life. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere, eternal. Can we agree on that definition of faith? Good with that? Well, let's add to it. So as a result of all the things that we believe about God, we also believe in Jesus, his son, and his death and resurrection as a way to cover for the sin of every person. Can we agree on that definition of faith? Is that a yes still? <laughs> Much quieter on the second one. Taking that to the next level, we accept that Jesus made this sacrifice on our behalf and on the behalf of everyone and anyone who believes. Is that something we can agree on as well? Excellent. So that's our definition of faith. So let's bring in James. We've been going through the book of James, and we've learned that this book was originally written and still pertains to those who are believing in the way of Jesus. We're going to read today, starting in uh, chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Ooh, 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 we know this one. It's no. We have to do things. And James says that in the next couple of verses. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So we can do that. We can feed people. We can do a coat drive. We can build stuff. We can send cards. We can make donations. So that's easy. And I think we're all done. Except that being good people, being nice people, doing nice things for other people, meeting together regularly to talk about doing that, is the definition of every nonprofit. And James says that too. Verse 18, now some may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Yeah, yeah, we got that already, the, the deeds thing. But let's go back to our definition of faith that we just talked about. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus, his death and resurrection, the atonement for sin, what James is talking about here is faith to an even higher level. So believing all of those things that we just talked about, we make the priority and the sole purpose of our lives to follow God. And you might say, Brenda, 
what are we doing here in this place on a Sunday morning, meeting together with other people who believe like we do if we're not following God? Is it possible that people could do all of those things and still not be following God? So today I get to talk about the subject that is the title of our series, God Talk and God Acts. And it seems like a pretty intuitive pattern for people who believe in the way of Jesus until we dig into it. We might find then that we don't actually really fully have the God talk part in hand. Isaiah wrote in chapter 29 here, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship, is based, their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they've been taught. Now, I, I'm going to bet that you're pretty familiar with Greek and Roman and even Norse mythology. Jupiter, the overarching god of the Roman mythology, um, is the name that we've given to our biggest planet. We wear shoes named after Nike, the goddess of speed. If you start on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the fifth day of our week is Thursday, Thor's day. And I can't tell you how many Zeus's, Athena's, Loki's, and Freya's I have seen on my exam table. Now think about what it would be like to live in a place where all of these little G gods were actually everything. And that's how it was for the Israelites when they were living in Egypt. There were gods and goddesses for everything. The sun, the moon, water, fertility, crops, everything. So when God called his people out of Egypt and started them on their journey to this land that he had promised to take them to, he gave them some guidelines for how to worship him, how to be atoned for the sin so that they could come near to him and how they could worship Yahweh, the one true God. So Isaiah's verse that we just read was written uh, several hundred years after Moses was given the Ten Commandments. So the commandments, the Levitical rules, the sacrifices, the rituals, all the holy days, those were well in play when uh, Isaiah wrote this. So the human rules are not the ones that Isaiah was referring to. What he was talking about were the tweaks that were made to God's laws. Maybe not to the words so much, but to what their original meaning was. So instead of those things representing the people's singular devotion, devotion to the one true God, the ceremonies and the sacrifices became a substitution for worship. But we wouldn't know anything about that, would we? I mean, like we're well past the whole um, hand washing and lamb's blood thing. You know, like we've got Jesus. Yes, we do. But have we tweaked that as well? Going to church, singing hymns, worship songs, memorizing scripture, even being baptized, those are all great things, biblical things, but they are not the thing. Ashley Ferris writes in her book, The Fabulous Journey, we must examine our intent and be open to the redirection of our motivation for the disciplines of the faith. So disciplines of the faith would be anything that somebody might say that is part of being a Christian and following God. Our disciplines keep us connected, but the mastery of the disciplines is not the goal. We must pursue the presence of God. So in other words, doing all of these things in our quest to become holy, we are worshiping not God, Holiness. So what is our God talk? What was our definition of faith in its highest form? This is Jesus talking in John 5. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God, who sent me, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. They have already passed from death into life. And then Jesus again in chapter 5 of John. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me, I'm sorry, I read that already. Now we're in John 15. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. 
Jesus says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So if that's our God talk, what kind of fruit are we producing? What are our God acts? Let's do a little if then. If we believe this, then we expect this to happen. So I'm gonna, this is a little audience participation. So if we believe in gravity and we drop an apple, we expect it to fall. If we believe fire is hot, then when we touch the flame, we will get... Okay, let's do another one. If we believe God is mighty, we will have a timid spirit and an uncertain outlook on life. No? Exactly. And that's what James means when he says in the, in the message um, paraphrase of chapter 2, verse 14, does merely talking about faith mean a person really has it? We just sang uh, the, these words, let the church live loud, we believe. So here are some examples of things that we believe. We believe God is creator of everything. But then we think our resources are limited and our circumstances are impossible. Or we might just settle for good enough because, you know, that's likely to be everything we're going to get. We believe God is loving, but then we draw this circle around me and mine. We believe God is perfect, but we insist that he use our human ideas, plans, and capabilities. We believe God is faithful and will trust him with everything except you fill in the blank. This God talk without God acts shows our faith for what it really is. And that's a hard truth. James uh, goes on to give two examples of faith. And Abraham and Rahab, of those two, Abraham is probably one more familiar to you. Abraham believed God when he promised Abraham that he would give him countless descendants. When God asked him to give up his only son, Abraham was willing because he believed God's promise. Rahab lived in Jericho, and when Moses and the Israelites were on the far side of the river, thinking about how they would enter the promised land that God had given to them, they sent some spies ahead to kind of see what was what. Rahab hid two of the Israelite spies in her own house and helped them escape, even though she knew it could cost her everything. She believed that the God of the Hebrews would spare her family during the attack on the city, and she did her part, believing that God would do his. So the order here is important. It's faith first and action second. Abraham and Rahab did not um, act to buy God's favor. They believed he had already given it. And then they did what was asked of them as his followers. So if you remember back to our first message in James, where Pastor Matt said, consider it joy when you have trials. The trials that they endured were the actions that proved the strength of their faith. We cannot act first because that's deeds without faith. And we can't not act because that's faith without deeds. Our faith has to happen first, every level of it, all the way to submitting our priorities and our purposes of our lives to God, fully turning over to him our plans, our future, our whole selves. And then we act according to what God asks each of us to do. Okay, let's go on to James chapter 3, and maybe that'll be a little bit less intense. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It takes only a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. 
By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it, smoke right from the pit of hell. Okay, well, maybe not so less intense. I know a bit about horses, no pun intended, um, and not a lot, but just in case you don't know as many things about horses as I do, I will let you know that when a horse is all saddled up with the reins and everything, the thing that's doing all the work to make this horse go where you want it to go is a bit of metal, a little tiny piece of metal that's about the size of my pinky finger crossways in the horse's mouth. The bridle is attached to it. The reins that the rider is holding are attached to it. If you don't have the bit, everything's lost. And then the horse will go wherever it wants to, which might be where you ask it to go, but probably not. I know even less about ships than I know about horses, but I do have a paddle boat story for you. Um, when I first came to uh, this church, uh, I was a youth counselor, and uh, we went on a summer's end retreat up to a lake. In the afternoon, we got to have lake time. Uh, so one of the older girls and I went out on the paddle boat, and I kind of vaguely remember somebody talking about the rudder being broken. And I was like, well, I don't know what that means, actually. And we're just going to go along the shoreline here, just kind of check things out. Uh, so the boys had taken canoes out to the middle of the lake where they bailed out of the boats to go swimming in the middle of the lake. And I realized what was happening out there about the same time the DNR came out to check fishing licenses on the lake. So they went to the boats in the middle of the lake as I went to the boats in the middle of the lake. The boys got back in the boat or their canoes, went back to shore. The DNR sped off. And then the wind came up right in our faces, blowing us away from where we wanted to go. So. The more we pedaled or paddled or pedaled, whatever it is, the more we stayed in the middle of the lake because we had no rudder that would get us in any direction that could give us traction to get back to the shoreline. And so Sonia and I sat out there in the middle of the lake because there was nowhere else we could go. And eventually somebody realized what was going on and sent the canoes back out, towed us into shore, and we got there in time for dinner. So end of story, happy ending. A bit and a rudder are very small but very powerful. And so is a spark when it comes in contact with something that could burn, which we've, we've heard of all the millions of acres of land that were burned over the last couple of years with the forest fires, and the wildfires out west especially. So these comparisons to the tongue that James is making remind us to pay attention to our speech. And it seems a little thing to just let something slip out and maybe we make fun of it afterward or go, oh, just kidding. You know, but that damage is done. Or vice versa, what should we have said in the moment? What word tore someone down or could have built someone up but didn't because we didn't think first about what we were saying? And that's what it requires right there, taking every thought captive, as we read in 2 Corinthians 10.5, making it obedient to Christ, evaluating whether whatever pops into our head should actually come out our mouth. In chapter 3, verse 9, James says, Sometimes the tongue praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. And this is what happens when we don't control our tongue. It's another, another example of God talk without God acts. So again, the order is important. First we believe, and then we speak. In Luke 6, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. We just sang, let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing, or in this case, greater than the words that we say. Even if we're not talking to God, every word that we speak is informed by what we believe about God. When we praise God for all that he has created, do we include ourselves in that? Or do we look in the mirror and walk away forgetting what we look like? Who we look like? Whose children we are? What kind of self-talk is coming out of our mouths? Because we can really do a number on our own confidence by criticizing and shaming ourselves for the things that we've done. While at the same time, God is saying, 
Look what I did for you. Do we really think that little of ourselves and Jesus' sacrifice that we would refuse it? In the here and now, let love invade. That's another line from the song we just sang. If we look at the people around us in the way that God looks at them, what would we see? And would that change the way that we talk to them or about them? Jesus told a story uh, to an expert who asked a question of him. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a story about a man who had been beaten by thieves and left for dead on the road. And two God talkers came by one at a time and went to the other side of the road, and they didn't even stop to check if he was alive. And a third man came, who was of a lower social circle, as he was told over and over again, and he stopped, and he checked on the man, and he took him for care, and he paid the bill himself. And Jesus said to the expert, which of these three men do you think was neighbor to the man who was beaten? And the expert said, well, the one who showed mercy. Jesus' answer to the expert and to us is, go and do the same. You may remember that the reason Jesus told this story was to answer a follow-up question to a statement he had made. And the expert's initial question was, of all the commandments and the rules and the rituals, which one is the one to follow? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, Jesus said. And... Love your neighbor as yourself. God talk and God acts. This week, I'm going to let you choose your actionable step. I'll give you this thing to consider first. This question. Two questions. What does your life reflect? What is your underlying motivation for the actions that you carry out? So your actionable step this week might be to nail that down. What are your beliefs about God, about Jesus, about the resurrection, about the forgiveness of sins? Or your homework might be looking at your life to decide what's conflicting with what you believe. How are you applying your personal faith to your everyday situations and struggles and dreams and goals that you have? Or maybe... You need to work on your words and look at that. What are you saying? What are you really saying with your words? What do you offer to the people around you? How do you feel about words like mercy, forgiveness, unconditional love, judgment? Or perhaps your actionable step will be to look at your actions. How do you spend your time? Are there places that you could bear someone else's burden? What would God have you to do with your skills, with your connections, with your resources, with your time? Again, from our song that we just sang, let the lost be found and the dead be raised. In the here and now, let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will save, and we believe. I'd like to invite you to pray with me this morning. Lord, you've given us everything from our very initiation as beings that are alive. You've given that to us. You've given us a chance to experience the the creation that you've put out for us. And you, most importantly, you've given us the chance to experience you and all of the fullness that you bring. We just pray this morning, Lord, that everything that we do in our lives would be guided by that, would be guided by you, and that as we wake up each day, we would pray, as the psalmist said, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart Be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Just pray your blessings on this people this day. That you would give us that strength that we need to be confident in our faith, 
give us that course correction that we might need if we've been not really paying attention to what we're doing. We pray for the same mercy to be shown through us to other people that you've shown to us. We just pray these, day, these things to stay, Lord. Work in us. Let us be your church. Let us be true to you. Let us be your love to those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.